Thank you for joining us for this conversation this evening with Professor Michael Marmot, Fazana Khan and Natalie Creary. Tonight's conversation is part of a series jointly curated by three organisations working on a shared mission to tackle inequality in London, My Fair London, the Equality Trust and Toynbee Hall. In this speaker series, we've already heard from some fascinating speakers, shareholder activists from Share Action, Dario Kenner, an independent researcher and author of the book Carbon Inequality, The Role of the Richest in Climate Change, and Pettifor, a political economist, author and public speaker, and Richard Wilkinson, co-author with Kate Pickett of The Inner Level and The Spirit Level. So you can see the talks have always had a focus on mobilizing people to fight against inequality, and we're continuing with this vital theme this evening. We're delighted to welcome for this evening's conversation three really amazing speakers. We're going to begin this evening with Sir Michael Marmot, Research Professor of Epidemiology and Public Health at University College London and an absolute expert in the subject. Fazana Khan, writer, director, cultural producer and award-winning arts educator as well as the executive director and co-founder of Healing Justice London, which cultivates public health provisions for collective liberation and dignifying lives made vulnerable. And Natalie Creary, director for Black Thrive, a partnership between statutory organizations, the voluntary sector and local communities working collaboratively to reduce mental health inequality experienced by African and African Caribbean communities in the London borough of Lambeth. There's much more I could say about our speakers, but I would prefer to leave the time for them to share their views. Michael's CV is long and impressive, um, and you can read so much about his work, but I want to hand straight over to him because what he's got to say is incredibly important. He's going to talk about the findings of the 10-year the review, and he's going to reflect on learnings from COVID-19 and ideas around risks and opportunities of tackling health inequalities post COVID-19. These are topics that we are all focused on. Um, and who better to hear from than Sir Michael Marmot. Michael, over to you. And thank you, Sharon. And as you said, I'm going to talk about the 10 years on report that I published in February. Initially, when the pandemic crashed upon us, I thought, well, that's it no one's going to pay any attention to what we said. But now, with the fact that the pandemic has exposed the underlying inequalities in society and amplified them, and as we think about what we have to do to build back better, I'd like to think that my review is highly relevant. I said when we published it in February, we've lost a decade and it shows. This is what has been happening to life expectancy. It had been increasing about one year every four years. This graph goes back to 1980, but in fact, if we took it back to 1890, it had been increasing about one year every four years. 2010, 11, that trajectory changed dramatically. The rate of increase in life expectancy stalled and towards the end, it had stopped improving altogether. Health follows the social gradient. The more deprived the area of residence, the shorter the life expectancy for men and for women. So it's not just people at the bottom the poor having shorter life expectancy, but a graded phenomenon. And the steepness of that social gradient increased over the last 10 years. And when we look at healthy life expectancy, the top graph is life expectancy, but the bottom graph is disability free life expectancy, the gradient is steeper. And you can see that about two thirds of the population do not have disability free life expectancy as long as 68. So if the pension age was going to be made older to 68, two thirds of the population may not be fit enough to work that long. We need to pay attention to the whole gradient and not just length of life, but quality of life. 
And you can see that the years in poor health for males and for females has been rising. Health inequalities stopped improving, years spent in ill health rising and the steepness of the social gradient increasing. And when we look at regional differences, really interesting, look at the least deprived 10%. This is women I'm looking at. And life expectancy did improve a bit in every region of England. And there were fairly small regional differences for the least deprived 10%. For the most deprived 10% of women, there are huge regional differences. Life expectancy for the poorest women in London went up, but in virtually every other region outside London, life expectancy for the poorest 10% of women went down. And to illustrate that, the whole gradient, here you've got London. You can see the poorer the area of residence, the shorter the life expectancy, and the northeast. And for people in the least deprived, it doesn't matter much where in the country you live. The more deprived you are, the bigger the disadvantage of living in the northeast compared with London and life expectancy actually declined for women in the bottom 10%. Now that really shouldn't happen. We're used to health improving all the time. And now suddenly we've got this triple pattern, failure of health to keep improving, increased inequality, and life expectancy for the poorest women outside London going down. And when we look at COVID-19, we see this really interesting pattern. The gray is all deaths, and you see the gradient, and the blue is COVID-19. It's a very similar pattern to all causes, and that means that the general causes of health inequalities are indeed the causes of inequalities in COVID-19, with some excess here at the bottom for COVID-19, which arguably is related to working in frontline occupations, crowded living conditions. And in Scotland, we see the same thing. All causes, the gradient and COVID-19 gradient. When we turn attention to Black, Asian and minority ethnic groups, here's the excess COVID-19 mortality in Black British, and about half that excess can be attributed to deprivation. Sing similarly, Bangladeshi or Pakistani, more than half the excess can be attributed to deprivation, and in women, most of it. That doesn't mean it's unimportant. It means we can explain much of the excess by the fact that BAME populations are living in more deprived circumstances. I was on the BBC when this was published. A senior government person said, yeah, this is very bad. Um, black people should wash their hands and practice social distance. And I was asked, what did I think? I said, good advice, but let's deal with structural racism. Yeah, but what should we do tomorrow? Tomorrow, we should start dealing with structural racism. In my 2010 review, we had six domains of recommendations. Equity from the start, give every child the best start in life. Education and lifelong learning, employment and working conditions. Number four, everyone should have at least the minimum income necessary for a healthy life. The fifth, healthy and sustainable places and communities. And the sixth one, taking the social determinants approach to prevention. Now in the 10 years on review, we didn't say much about lifestyle. For this reason, these data come from the Food Foundation. If people followed their health 
the eating advice, then those in the bottom 10% of household incomes in England would have to spend 74% of their household income on food. If they ate healthily, who's going to pay the rent? And if they paid the rent, who's going to pay for heating? So get the other five domains right, and people will adopt healthy lifestyles. And we see during COVID-19, this is food insecurity, again from the Food Foundation, pre-COVID-19 and during the pandemic. Two million children are food insecure during the pandemic. So what happened in 2010? Well, we had a change of government and the government said, we will reduce public expenditure. They didn't quite say we want to roll back the state, but that is what they wanted to do. In 2009-10, public expenditure was 42% of gross domestic product. And by 2018-19, that 42% had gone down to 35%. They were successful. They did roll back the state. But they did it in a regressive way. This is council spending per person. In the least deprived 20% of areas, council spending, that's the gray bars, went down by 16%. And in the most deprived 20%, it went down by 32%. I showed a version of this from the World Health Organization and she looked at it, she said, you're making this up. I've never seen anything quite as regressive as that, she said. Not making it up, real data. I showed a version of this graph to a former government minister and said, your government's policy was to make poor people poorer. And he said, well, maybe it wasn't our explicit policy. Yeah, but that was the predicted effect. Now, we've been very worried about care homes. Look at spending on the adult component of social care. Went down by 3% in the least deprived 20%. Went down by 16% in the most deprived 20%. Care workers, workers in care homes, are paid the minimum wage, if that, more than half get less than the living wage. And judged in its own terms, that government policy didn't work. This is the wage growth in the UK 2007 to 2018. It was negative. Only worse were Greece and Mexico. And most OECD countries had positive wage growth. So whatever the government was doing in terms of economic policy was not delivering economic well-being, but it was creating real problems. Look at children living in poverty. In 2010-11, after housing costs, now poverty is defined as less than 60% median income. 27% in poverty, that went up to 30%. Three weeks ago, I think it was, in Parliament, the Prime Minister said, poverty has gone down, child poverty has gone down. I thought, I just published a report saying it's gone up. And the Children's Commissioner published on their website, the Prime Minister was wrong. I thought perhaps there was a time when a Prime Minister making an incorrect statement to Parliament who would come back and apologize. He came back the following week and doubled down on his incorrect statement. And if you look at household type, take lone parent not working, 62% of children were in poverty in a household headed by a lone parent not working in 2010-11. That 62% went up to 70% in 2017-18. Work was supposed to be the way out of poverty. So let's look at a lone parent in full-time work. 18% of children were in poverty in 2010-11, and that had gone up to 
and the numbers of workers in poverty increased. Let's look at tax and benefit changes that the Chancellor made in 2015 to 2017. And look at working age families with children. In the most deprived 10%, as a result of changes to the tax and benefits system, income would go down by just a bit more than 15%. In the next decile, it would go down by 12%, in the third bottom by 9%, and then the richer you were, the less the drop. An attack to increase inequality. Number of households in temporary accommodation increased quite sharply. Number of people sleeping rough increased quite sharply. Among the cuts that were made were affecting Sure Start Children's Centres, a thousand of which closed. Youth counselling centres closed. Education maintenance allowance stopped. And then there was an increase in violence. People were wringing their hands saying, oh my gosh, more young people are committing violent crime, worried about knife crime. Well, if you stop investing in improving early child development, you increase child poverty, close down youth counselling centres and the like, it's not a total surprise that you should get an increase in violence. And it's related to deprivation. The more deprived the area, the greater the increase in violence. This is PM10, air pollution, most deprived quintile, least deprived quintile in all these English cities. The greater the de deprivation, the greater the exposure to air pollution. And I show that because I want to make the point about climate change and health equity. The specifics don't matter for the moment, but we did say that new housing should be carbon neutral and aim for net zero greenhouse gas emissions. The point being that we want to bring the climate change agenda and the health equity agenda together. So what might building back better look like? Where might I have got this quote from? A well-being approach can be described as enabling people to have the capabilities they need to live lives of purpose, balance, and meaning for them. Philosopher Amartya Sen could be, but in fact, it was the New Zealand Treasury. Uh, at the heart of economic policy in New Zealand in 2019, before COVID-19, was a well-being approach enabling people to have the capabilities they need to live lives of purpose balance and meaning for them. As we think about building back better, let's no, not go back to where we were before the pandemic. As my 2020 report showed, that was not a very de desirable state. Let's think about building back better, putting a well-being approach at the heart of what we're trying to achieve. Thank you. Michael, thank you so much. Really thought provoking. And I know that you'll have been focusing on presenting. So I just want to tell you that there's been so much chat uh, happening, people saying really interesting, really informative, uh, people asking for your presentation. Uh, and, and, you know, we can work on those things afterwards. But thank you. You've just given us so much to think about. Um, I really want to hand over straight away uh, to Fazana Khan. And Fazana is going to respond to Michael's review, bringing, um, bringing their expertise and perspectives from the work that Fazana does yeah, with Healing Justice London and a, and a wider perspective. So Fazana, uh, my pleasure to introduce you. Hi, and um, thank you everyone, uh, the, all the organizers, Michael, for your presentation. Um, I actually 
um, wanted to begin from a point that Michael just made, which I think is really telling. Michael, you know, being white, male, and esteemed uh, a figure recognized in public health was not believed when he presented this information. And now imagine racialized bodies, working class bodies, chronically sick bodies, who have been saying this over and over again. The analysis that uh, Michael put together has shared is lived knowledge within us, embodied knowledge within us. And it, it's made a really meaningful contribution, but it really speaks to the heart of how inequity is perpetuated in this country and more globally, that who is believed, uh, why are they believed, and why are we not listening? And specifically around COVID, where it's probably the exceptionalization, like the, the experience of everyone could be susceptible, that suddenly it was flagged, and suddenly it was more of a public concern, but it wasn't as much of a public concern when we started to see the disproportionate deaths in working class communities and those working class communities being racialized. So I really wanna start from that point. I think there are really meaningful contributions in the Marmot Review and the report, and we've definitely at Healing Justice um, used it and learned from it. Um, but what I want to touch on, and I think in the way and the approach that I'll be speaking today, is from a much more localized perspective. This is not about data, this is about the actual stories that we are rooted in, in our experiences. And that is something that then, as we see in the report, that intersectionality, beyond the cause and effect, what is the causality, what are the root systemic issues, that is what we want to get to, and how is oppression a compounding um, cause of um, the inequalities and the injustices that these communities are experiencing. So um, what I'm actually going to do is start from a personal position because my, you know, healing justice, my practice came out from the harms that we experienced in public health provisions and the absence of it. So I wanna bring, bring the focus, bring the position to an authentic space, but also think about the democratization of access to public health, who gets to be participating in public health as a knowledge producer, as a person who's telling the truth, as a person who's believed. Um, so I'm going to begin with a short uh, personal uh, extract from an essay I wrote a couple of years ago, and then I'll be speaking to um, connecting with the Marmot Review. What are what do we need to know in this moment? Who can show us that, and what have been the barriers? Um, and then the potentiality maybe we can touch on towards the end. So I'm going to begin from that point, um, just sharing. At dinner, Aziza takes out tablet after tablet and places it beside her plate. We fill our stomachs with things one should not, politics, philosophy, religion, and really there are only a few things on the menu we can consume. We push away and around mentioning loss, defeat, or death like veg on plates. After the first pill, Aziza finally says it. In essence, my body is trying to kill me. Ten months prior, doctors at Royal London Hospital tower over my body. Numerous examinations lead them to diagnose me with undiagnosis. Miss Khan, we don't know why it happened or what caused it. It is just sometimes these things that happen to women. I'm struck by how I have never heard of things that just happen to men. How resources, privilege and institutional protection are put towards making sure things don't just happen to men. And this is not separate to the fact that most of the houses on the council estate I grew up in always had someone surviving cancer, or that years of frontline and youth community work taught folks like me a fluency in suicide and loss, or that the last three times I visited my father in recess in a bed lying next to him in the hospital was a black or brown youth stabbed, habitual and intimate structural bereavement not coincidence, coincidences, but commonplace amongst the marginalized communities in Britain. Reminding us, those of us regulated to the margins, lost not only continuous, but cumulative. How you are made vulnerable is also how you are made vulnerable. Meaning when poverty leads us to sickness or institutional racialized violence leads to trauma, it follows then that the public health infrastructures by proximity to the state 
also make us vulnerable to state harm and violence. And I think this is a really key point that I want to begin from because while we're talking about public health, the current public health systems that we have are still not safe for, for bodies like mine, for bodies like Natalie, for the communities that we are part of, that we're in solidarity for. And so if we're really going to have these conversations about tackling health injustice and inequity, then we really have to think about how our framings have to move beyond the kind of under-resourcing and the cuts, but also connect with the, deplete, the eugenics, the racialized dimensions of how we understand what health is. And exactly also what Professor Marmot said about the systemic racialized um, efforts, uh, anti-racist efforts that we need to, to be taking forward. And while I am going to be speaking from a space of critiquing public health, um, it's not from a place that I'm anti-public health, it's that our lives depend on it. And it's from that space of love and actually potential to grow and actually reflect our communities that I'm speaking from. And that visions for our public health has to rely on bodily dignity of bodies that aren't even in our imaginations in a regular sense. So from that space, I think it's really important. Like, you know, I looked through, when I looked through the report, things that stood out for me, and, and this comes to my kind of like first key point of what do we need to know? The mention of racism was only once and trauma wasn't um, touched upon in the, the sense of like trauma, either in terms of mental health trauma or physiological impact, but not what trauma does to our bodies. And if you are experiencing poverty induced trauma, if you are experiencing racialized trauma, we still don't know, um, those with lived experience do, how it reduces your capacities, how it reduces your ability, um, your immune systems, your ability to regulate yourself, your ability to participate in life. And so for me, when we're starting to have these conversations around reducing health inequality, I'm so excited at the potential of where we take a trauma analysis that understands where race intersects. Um, so trauma being a central point and racialized trauma being a key part of that. Another aspect that I want to kind of draw out in terms of what we need to know alongside that trauma is how we know. And I know Natalie speaks on this as well, so I won't kind of go into it too much. But the Western knowledge production, which relies on the totalizing of reason, which relies on a cause and effect model. And when we look at Euro non-Eurocentric models of healing and wealth and um, health, and wealth um, look to other ways in which you are able to be treated, you are able to listen to, which include the body as a site of knowledge, our art, our language, our song as ways of knowing and being able to understand and connect. So I think the hierarchies of knowledge of who is a knowledge producer, who is a legitimate knowledge producer, as I mentioned earlier, as a, is at the key of it, a key point in terms of how we are going to move forward, but also how we democratize public health. Of course, there is expertise um, and people who train in it, but until you know, and uh, until we are moving in the direction of a much more civic engaged that everyone gets to participate in public health, we're going to still reproduce these dynamics of hierarchy and also leave people out. It will not be a robust public health system or ecosystem that we need, and it will absolutely perpetuate the disproportionate res res um, deaths in communities that are forgotten and abandoned in that public consciousness. Um, I'm going to briefly touch on, because uh, I'm also conscious of time, who can show us that? Of course, you know, a key point is lived experience. People who have lived experience are the people who should be listened to, who should be the people who we are trusting. And how do you engender that trust? Because um, we have been failed over and over again. As I mentioned earlier, mental and public health, uh, physical health services have also been sites of violence and harm for us. So how do we engender that trust? That, that trust and how do we become part of it and what is the role that those that are white, those that are in senior leader position, leadership positions within public health and corresponding sectors doing to create that capacity and create that relationship of knowledge transference between the mainstream and those marginalized. Um, I think I also just touching on um, that point of capacity, if we did have a trauma response, um, and we had a trauma strategy, people would be able to be present in order to participate and then shape as agents what 
meaningful participate participation would look like a lot of the times you know you hear there's an underrepresentation in research of black and brown um, communities people of color but you know i'm in a different capacity i i'm i've been uh, part of the resourcing racial justice um, coalition which is you know redistributing a million towards as part of a covid response and beyond um towards communities of color and the racial justice agenda. And what I've seen there is a high volume of community-led health initiatives from people of color communities. And what that shows is we might be absent in the research and there are reasons and biases towards that, but we are present in the work and building those alternatives and solutions. And why aren't those being uplifted? Why aren't those being recognized? And why aren't they being legitimized? So that is, uh, I'm gonna I'm just being gonna be mindful of time and then I guess um, the the I think I'm actually gonna just park on this point because I think my time um, has come to an end but I will pick up a few more points in the Q&A section um, and I'm gonna hand over to, to Sean for Natalie. Fazana thank you so much that was powerful um, and again you won't have had the opportunity but the comments section is going yeah it's busy <laughs> people asking questions and we're we're going to draw some out for you in the q a thank you so much natalie let me invite you now to to share your perspective and your expertise and and to reflect on what you've heard from michael and fazana let me let me introduce you now natalie Hey, um, thank you. And thank you, um, Michael and um, Fasana, for your contributions. It's certainly given me um, an awful, awful lot of food for thought. Um, so I suppose there'll be some things that I'll be um, touching on that kind of will also kind of resonate with some of the things that Fasana has already um, raised. So when I um, read the report, I thought I'd kind of share some of my reflections, um, but also um, what we experience or you know my team and I experience in terms of working with the system um, in order to improve and uh, the experiences for black communities and in particular around reducing uh, mental health inequalities by paying kind of close attention to structural racism and how that kind of manifests itself and the impact that it has on our, on our communities um, and I think in principle I think the kind of recommendations that come from, from the report make sense to some extent in terms of you know, nobody would argue that every child should have the best starting life and you know we should have access to kind of fair and, and good work um, but I think that what we often don't really spend much time doing is actually questioning why people don't have these opportunities and I think in particular in our work at Black Thrive um, our interaction with the system and when I talk about the system, I'm also talking about the people who work within it. Um, we don't interrogate this question enough. And so I think although the narrative, when we're thinking about inequalities, um, the narrative around the social determinants of health is welcomed, but I still think it's very narrow. And I think Barzano kind of uh, explained that really, really articulately. Um, and again, I also picked up that the report did talk about or did mention racism and discrimination in terms of it influencing our health outcomes. But I think that because it wasn't necessarily uh, a kind of integral part of the, uh, in terms of us understanding the social determinants of health, I think that there's a risk that we get sidetracked and focus largely on the interpersonal uh, forms of racism, which most of us are aware of and familiar in terms of you know, somebody potentially giving somebody a, a poor service because of biases that they may hold about a certain group. Um, we rarely kind of stretch our minds to kind of understand the social determinants in the context of structural racism, how legislation, policies, processes, the allocation of the source creates the environment where black and brown bodies are disproportionately neglected, excluded, detained and killed. And so without paying attention to this, we really risk developing uh, interventions that yes, are well intentioned, but are still not fit for purpose. So when we're looking at how you create that environment where every child has the best start in life, we need to ask ourselves, how is racism and other forms of oppression preventing them from realizing their potential and what structural change is needed to make a fundamental shift in their outcomes. And what I would say is that you can't answer that question yourself. You cannot rely on the evidence base alone. 
and you probably can't rely on that expert in your network to help you solve this problem. And I'll tell you why, and that's because if you don't have lived experience, you really can't speak to these issues with real authenticity. Um, if you have lived experience, your experience is absolutely an asset, but we need to be mindful that when we are representing our communities, we're not a homogenous group, and that our social identities, space, place, and time will all play a role in how we might experience similar challenges. So for me, this really highlights the importance of working with communities who, who have lived it, but also those who are living it now, because without that, we really won't know what we're, what we're dealing with, you know, what challenging, challenge kind of really faces us. Um, in terms of one of the things that kind of really resonates with me within the report is that need to work in partnership, um, and that's across sectors. And, that reflects, you know, we see a very similar thing in our work and it's, you know, we're most effective and make most traction when we are working in partnership. But I just wanted to share some of my reflections on uh, the role of the voluntary sector in this. And the, the voluntary sector absolutely have insights into the experiences of those who are most affected. However, the depth and breadth of that insight and the impact that they're actually having on the ground is quite variable and the way in which this work is resourced also isn't equitable and i think for for us in terms of some of our reflections around the covid pandemic this became really evident so the way in which governments and funders were trying to respond quite quickly in terms of releasing funds the process that they went through meant that for small and often often kind of underfunded uh, black-led organisations, because I'm, I'm speaking from that perspective because I, you know, operate a, a black-led organisation, um, we're not able to respond to these calls because, you know, we don't have a team of, you know, writers who can, you know, write bids for us, you know, to our disposal. So increasingly what we're seeing is that white-led organisations are kind of hoovering up the funds and therefore what we also notice is that they often don't have that reach into communities. And so they depend on organizations like us to do the backbreaking work to help them deliver their outcomes and often without remunerating us for our time. Um, and I think that for funders, they really need to think about the opportunities to remove structural barriers um, in, in terms of the way in which they fund. So to be thinking about how you secure benefits beyond the benefits of the beneficiaries of the project. Um, and I think some of the sort of feedback that we've provided to, to, to funders that we have worked with is that if you shortlist only consists of white-led organisations, um, there's probably something structurally flawed with your process. Um, if you're resourcing an organisation who has current issues around diversity and inclusion, that should be an immediate red flag. Um, because if they can't solve the issues of inequities within their own structures. What confidence can you have that they're going to be able to help you with yours? Um, and so for me, it's kind of the bottom line, line is that you need us. Um, and I think if you look at the inequalities gap, you've demonstrated that you can't do it without us. Um, but it can't be on your own terms. And um, as a community, I think often when we're talking about marginalized communities, um, we assume that we have no power, but actually we have power and we have agency. But it's often the reluctance of those that work in the system um, that limits the ability for us to make progress. And so what I would say is that you need to use your power to remove those barriers, not to assume that we can't or that we don't have the capacity or the capability. Um, and if you don't know, say so. Um, but what's important is that you work with us to kind of create that space that enables black-led organisations and communities to take the lead. And for me, that is true allyship. Um, Spartana's talked about the kind of issues around the evidence base, and you can't rely on the evidence base because much of the knowledge is biased and structurally racist. And so whether you look at the topics a funder decides to invest in, the lack of representation of um, people undertaking the research, uh, whether the research is even considered newsworthy enough to you know, find its way into a high impact journal or to be featured in a report or in the media. This process fundamentally shapes what and how we come to know 
And empirical research in particular, but not exclusively, is fundamentally biased. Um, and it's considered the gold standard. And what is produced becomes the truth. And it's this truth that shapes our mindsets, it shapes our behaviors, it influences the policies that we produce, the design processes that we, you know, that we go through, and the decisions that we make about how resource is allocated. Um, and so if we're thinking about that knowledge production piece in relation to what it is that we know about black people, we are either hypervisible or we're invisible. Um, and I would challenge anyone to find an abundant amount of literature in high impact journals that seeks to celebrate and learn from the great things and the greatness about my community. Um, we're often very good uh, at describing the problem, um, but there's no wonder why we haven't come any closer to actually delivering a solution because research on communities and in particular black communities and other marginalized communities is always from a deficit perspective. Um, and so I think that that is something that um, we really need to start paying um, attention to. And I'm not suggesting that we abandon the literature, um, but at the very least, we need to critique the work beyond whether somebody used the right statistical technique or had a sufficient sample size. We need to critique it from a social, cultural, political and historical perspective. Um, and we mustn't forget that this knowledge needs to be supplemented with the insight and skills and expertise of the people who face and are living through and navigating these structural barriers. And in Black Thrive, we're very early on in our journey, but we are working with uh, community researchers. And what we're finding is that they, are, they have a reach and are able to surface insights that would ordinarily be out of the view of the system. And so we think that there are huge opportunities in working with communities in this way, but what we need to make sure is that that process is equitable, that it is appropriately resourced, that communities can take ownership, and that they also have ownership of the research outputs as well. Um, and I think in terms of when we're thinking about why you can't rely on the expert in your network, and again, Fazana has touched on this as well, is that it depends who you consider to be an expert. Is it the person who's been researching the topic for decades? Is it the person who's worked in the, you know, an area or the field for years or the person who has lived experience? And I think they all have a role to play, but in reality, the researcher and the professional are often our first point of call. Um, and I think for similar reasons, as I've outlined earlier, that actually if your expert doesn't have lived experience, if they cannot demonstrate how they embody anti-racist practice in their work, and if they don't have the reach into the communities, are they really best placed to help you? Um, and they certainly shouldn't be the only person who is shaping your thinking. Um, and basically, I think I'll just end on, because I'm conscious of time, our participation shouldn't be an afterthought. So if you realize we're missing when you're around the table and you've pulled your panel together and you realize it's all looking very white, very male, not very diverse, uh, you need to recognize that that effort to improve our outcomes, you weren't thinking about us. Um, because if you were, you would have reached out at a much earlier stage. So I would say that we need to be placing communities at the center, obviously diversify your workforce, um, and to reach out to individuals and organisations who can actually help you reach your community. Natalie, thank you so much. Again, such a powerful, stimulating set of thinking. Um, and again, the chat is full of, of so many questions and thoughts and responses that you know people provoked by what you've said. So. Thank you. Um, really powerful. So we're going to pick up on some questions. And um, one thing that I'm really excited by is that the first two questions are actually coming from peer researchers that we at Toynbee Hall uh, work with. Um, and so picking up on, on, on kind of Natalie's challenge there about, you know, who is best placed to, to understand and, and kind of really uh, kind of explain and describe and and 
uh, and take forward what people are experiencing and needing better than the people themselves. And at Toynbee Hall, we've been moving away from kind of classic research of doing to people uh, to participatory action research of working with people over the last few years. And one of the pieces of the work that um, the peer research community that we support are working on at the moment is the disproportionate impact of COVID-19. And we asked them if they would like to put questions to the speakers and many of them are on the call today and I've got two questions from them. So that's where we're going to begin. So the first question that I'm going to ask the panel is what actions could the government take now to protect black and Asian and other disproportionately affected ethnic minority communities from the health impacts of COVID-19? And if it's all right, I'd like to start with you, Natalie, um, and then ask Fazana, and then ask Michael. Um, so if you want me to repeat the question, that's no, 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 that's fine. That's fine. Um, I think for me, and, and, and just kind of reflecting on our, our work, the biggest challenge is actually getting the system to acknowledge that it's structurally racist. Um, because if, if people were more open to exploring that, uh, we would make we make far more traction and progress, but that seems to be for us the biggest barrier because people are always more comfortable locating the problem within the individual, their family, their community. But actually, when you're having to look at it from a structural pers perspective, you're having to take responsibility as that officer in terms of your role in that system, um, and that I think is much harder for us to. Um, to deal with and to cope with. Um, so, and that's maybe not about investment. That is, I think for me, that would be the first start. And then I think um, having um, an income that you're able to, 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 to live on and thrive on is really important. But from a black perspective, uh, having money in our pocket isn't gonna help us address and deal with the trauma that we experience from dealing with racism on a daily basis. So we will still find ourselves in a position where, uh, you know, black communities will still experience inequalities in, in health because even though they have money in their pocket. And, and we still see that in terms of, you know, black people who are uh, more socially, in terms of higher up in the kind of socioeconomic, uh, in the higher socioeconomic position, um, still don't necessarily um, experience the same health gains as a result of that. Thank you. I'm going to just pass straight on to Fazana because it's it's you three that we want to hear from. Fazana. Um, so yeah, just to I completely agree with Natalie, and I think to build off it because also I don't know, you know, our the government isn't listening to public health in uh, you know experts in the first place. So I guess my invitation is not just like what the government needs to be doing to address it, but also public health practitioners, people who are in leadership positions, and also the public who are reinforcing or, uh, you know, um, and perpetuating the inequalities. So this is not just to the government, it's to all of us on the call and beyond. I think there definitely needs to be, you know, we've touched on lived experience and anti-racist practice um, being at the heart of the work and in leadership right and you know lived experience can become weaponized when you have to exist in a power dynamic where you don't actually have any power so i think that there needs to be something around lived experience leadership and also the capacity to to be led by that leadership so you know things that so often are seen as risks that people of color put forward um, should actually be trusted and we should be allowing ourselves to go in that direction and specifically this is you know um, connected in the subject matter what is relevant to communities that are experiencing health inequalities you know, I, I touched on trauma and investment into trauma work is absolutely necessary. Some other examples that are key, Nati talked about economic justice. Um, for us at Healing Justice, and, and we've got a research that we've been developing with a team, fantastic team, Litany of Survival, who are on, on the chat today, um, around loss and bereavement. And the reason that we chose to do this participatory research on, on public health and loss and bereavement was because black and brown communities experience disproportionate, isolated and interconnected loss. So how does what we're invested in serve the communities that are most marginalized and most vulnerable? 
similarly prevent medac just released a fantastic report on the relationship between prevent and um and islamophobia within public health those are nuanced key areas that affect our communities but if we were starting to invest in those areas we'd be able to deal with those specific um nuances that make us more fragile fragile but also start to engender the trust needed because the prioritization towards things that matter to our lives prioritization prioritization towards things that affect us um would be showing up and we'd move far more ahead than having baseline converse, baseline conversations around diversity and inclusion so the the arena needs to change and that needs to be led by those with lived experience as we all kind of touched on Zana, thank you. Michael, can I invite you again the same question? What actions can the government take now to protect those communities most affected? Yeah, and well, let me answer it by, in a way, responding to the sharp comments by Natalie and Fazana. And um, what I would say is make the evidence um, from large scale studies your friend, not your enemy just as people who work with those data need to understand exactly what you've said about lived experience. So let me say what I mean. Let me start with George Floyd and the murder of George Floyd by a policeman. What we know is that in the US, the police kill about a thousand people a year of which just over 30% are African-American, given that the population is 13% African-American. That's clear evidence of structural racism. Let's take another indicator, income. If you look at African-American women, I'll come to the men in a moment, African-American women, they have lower income than white women. But for both white women and black women, their income is closely correlated with parents' income. When you take account of parents' income, in other words, rich parents tend to have rich offspring, poor parents tend to have poor offspring, then the income of black women and white women are the same once you've taken account of parents' income. So you could say that the racism there, uh, in a way, is closely tied up with who has low income. I think, Fazana, you raised that question. Why are people differentially exposed to the social determinants of health? But when you look at men, there's the same relation between parents' income and the income of their offspring, adult offspring. But for each level of parental income, black men have lower income than white men. It's not like the female um, picture. And I don't know how else you describe that, but structural racism. And it's not simply picked up by income. It's not just that poor parents had poor kids. And part of what you see is that the black, black young men are being locked up uh, put into prison and jail at disproportionate rates. It's structural racism. And I could go through other data like that. So it's not the case that the data are all, uh, everything published in journals, uh, that these data I'm citing are done by a Harvard professor of economics. It's not the case that everything published in journals is biased and doesn't take into account what's going on. I know there's structural racism based on that kind of evidence. When I was in New Zealand the last couple of times visiting Maori communities, and one of the people in one of the Maori communities said, when university researchers came to us and said they wanted to do research, we quickly figured out if they wanted to use us to get another publication, in which case we said, we're not interested. But if they wanted to partner with us, if they want really to engage with us, which I think is what you're both saying, 
then we were very happy to partner with them. And I, in my WHO Commission report, talked about empowerment. At other times, you could talk about agency, about control, and that agency of communities is actually key. It's not something that can be imposed from above. It's actually key. It's key to the whole process. So that uh, I'm in total agreement with you of engaging with communities because it's key to the whole thing that something imposed from above with a set of solutions from above, I'm overstating it now, never works um, because it doesn't actually deal with what you said, people's lived experience. That it, um, engaging with communities is part of the way forward. Michael, thank you. That's a, a really interesting response to some of the, the challenges, I suppose, that Fazana and Natalie have raised. And I'll, I'll ask them if they want to come back in a moment. Before I do that, um, I, I think I want to kind of come back to you and, and say, that was a really interesting response, but um, I feel like I've got peer researchers on the on the uh, the chat who are still probably wondering what you think government can do now to protect people. And I'd really like to come back to you on that because I think sure. we'd really like to hear well, from you. When I was talked about my response to the BBC interview and I said, start dealing with structural racism now, he wanted me to talk about, in a way, short term, things you could do tomorrow, you know, make, make masks available or something. But I want to deal with the fact that who's not being protected in frontline occupations? And why is it that uh, people from Black, Asian and minority ethnic groups are overly represented in high risk occupations um, without proper uh, personal protective equipment and the like. Um, that's the short term. But cam coming back of dealing with the life course that I laid out in my report, and um, exactly as Fazana said, we need to ask the question why certain ethnic groups are more likely to be overrepresented in each of those. Uh, unfavorable categories. And I think what government can do is to be asking that question um, so that they're not only asking the question about socioeconomic differences, but they're asking the question about how all of those social determinants of health uh, put communities of color at disadvantage. Um, Fazana, do you want to come in? Yeah, I, I would I would like to come in and I think what we should offer to the space is that both Natalie and I do see the value of data and research and as a friend in, in the work, but what we're also highlighting and it's very evident in, in the things that we both have shared from our practice, from our communities, is that data in our hands has also been used against us. It has been used against our communities. And uh, my colleague actually yesterday, Lanny Parker, said, we don't need more proof of racism, right? We also know that there are clear ties between racial capitalism, uh, colonialism, and the brutalization of black and brown bodies. The fact that we have a Western uh, medical system that is disembodied, that is disassociative, and that doctors approach us saying we want to work and be trained in embodied um, training that helps us, you know, diagnose or treat or connect with our patient. All of those things reveal to us that we live um, as a result of these compounding oppressions and the evidence is already there. So now the, con the, the conversation returns back to what are the barriers to belief, trust and access to these knowledge, um, the knowledges that already exist, and what what are the kind of deliberate um, epistemicides and de deliberate ways in which we are uh, denied knowing, and and so I think that's what I want to return to and refocus because we can absolutely hold that data has a. Uh, has a value, but it's not working and it's definitely not working for racialized and marginalized communities. Kazana, thank you. I think it's a really important point that you're making that, you know, that data is, 
is helpful, but it's alone and uh, it's not doing the job that we need to get done. And so we need to find more effective, powerful ways. And I, and I heard both you and Natalie say really clearly that you know, if, if even someone with Michael's status isn't listened to, then how on earth do we push through? Um, Natalie, I'd really like to, I can't see you right now, I'd really like to invite you to respond to that if you'd like to, but... Um... Yes, absolutely. And I would echo what um, Farzama said. Um, it's not that, I suppose, why would we, uh, my question would be, why would, if we understand that structural racism permeates every aspect of our society, why would we think the knowledge base in terms of the literature would be any different? Because, you know, and, and that, that, that for me is kind of key. And it's not to say that you do, and I, and I was quite clear, I said, it's not that I'm saying that we need to do away with that in terms of that knowledge. But what we do need to do is be very critical of it so that we are aware of where issues are potentially arising. So when I started my PhD and I was looking at research in my communities, I couldn't see myself in studies that were about me. And that is fundamentally about the lens that the researcher is using to describe the experience of people within my community. So we need to be pay attention to the knowledge base and how that's produced and who has access and, and who makes the decision. So there are people obviously in the racial justice and social justice space who are writing um, on these topics. But actually, if you look at where those articles are published, they're usually in low impact journals. So that in itself, um, there's a value placed on that knowledge. And there was a recent systematic review that was looking at whether public health journals had actually used the term structural racism. So yes, the literature may be describing it when you're looking at the inequalities, but we're not naming it. And by not naming it, it leaves the reader open to their own interpretations. And if we know that we're in a structurally racist society, people will have their assumptions. So I often say, if you look at the inequality in Lambeth around employment, um, you know, you, we can see that, you know, black people um, are 50% less likely to be in employment. Now, you could come with all sorts of re reasons for why that might be. So if we also think about the structural issues that, those, that our communities are experiencing, then you could actually then, it's not that we potentially don't have jobs, we don't have jobs because we're not educated, we don't have jobs because uh, you know, we don't have that ambition to, to work. But when you understand it from a structural perspective where you might be applying for jobs, but because you, ha you don't have a name that's a European sounding name, it means that your application isn't gonna be um, even looked at, you then to start to understand why you have those, you know, why you see those disparities. And that for me is what fundamentally is missing in the literature. If it helps, can I just say, I agree with what Natalie just said. Um, it's, I mean, everything you said about the description of structural racism and the identification, I agree completely. Thank you. Um, there's so much in this conversation and I'm really mindful that I've got about four minutes um, and I want to take a question that people have, have kind of put through in the chat. And so listening to this discussion, I'm, I'm going to take this question from Jennifer Took Merchant. And Jennifer asks, how much do the panel members feel that these ambitions to improve equality and tackle the ecological or climate crisis are achievable through democratic processes under the current government, or is it going to take a bigger, more powerful paradigm shift through nonviolent direct action and protests to achieve real change? Um, Fazana, can I start with you, then I'll come to Michael, and then I'll end with Natalie, if that's okay. Um, I mean, what we're seeing is that we have, especially for marginalized groups, we've been failed by the state. I think that 
there is a framework already available, um, an abolition framework that is being used right now. And what abolition is so powerful is that it's talking about public infrastructure. What is the public infrastructure that we can create beyond punitive cultures, beyond disposability, beyond getting rid of things that we don't understand, that we can't rehabilitate, but actually work to build um, uh, adequate interconnecting infrastructure that may, builds community health, that builds community safety, that bef you know knows how to de-escalate instead of criminalizing people for the ways that they're surviving. So I think there are frameworks beyond those two binaries um, that are already available. And, and what I do agree is that there needs to be a collective movement. And when I mentioned democrati democratizing I th earlier on, I personally believe that public health is the single factor because all of us are patients to a degree, some of us more than others because of everything that's been discussed, that all of us, if, if we use public health in, in the way um, that it offers a democratizing potential, that we really invited ourselves to that movement approach um, and that we dealt, connected the social justice issues, we will, we would be somewhere else and our society um, globally and locally would look different. I'd also want to touch on another framework that is available connected to abolition is the disability justice movement and I think that's a really key point. I don't know why we're not talking about it enough. Disability justice separate from disability rights which is much more connected to rights and policies connects climate justice, connects our environments, connects the hostile um, environment, connects um, the, the notion of ableism, whose bodies are desired, valuable, and um, you know, disposed of or abandoned. So disability justice, again, is a framework that is available, led by those with lived experience, who can offer us the insights of what a robust public health could look like for all of us through um, rooting it in the margins, who can help us reflect the center. So I think that there, those two uh, approaches I would really encourage folks to get into and look at. Susanna, thank you so much. Michael, can I come to you next, please? Yeah, democracy is under so much threat at the moment that I would never want to contribute to anything that put it under even more threat. Um, the alternatives look dreadful. So um, saying democracy is not the right way forward. But again, I agree with what Fazana said. Democracy is more than voting once every so often. Democracy is being heard and communities being heard, whether it's taking to the streets, um, uh, being heard in local government, in the voluntary sector, it's being heard and it's being empowered. The Black Lives Matter in the US looks like, we'll have to see, more than a moment, it looks like a movement. Um, it looks like a movement. It's been around for a while. It could be ignored by the politicians. It's harder for them to ignore now. It looks much more like a movement than it does like a moment. And that's part of living in a democracy. But it's much more than simply voting once every two or four years. Uh, it's actually being out there, being heard, um, the, the power of people to be heard. And as I said, we, we said in our commission report for WHO that empowerment was key. And empowerment is not something that's granted by people at the top. Empowerment, we talked about a nutcracker. We want to engage governments, but we want to engage populations and communities and people. And you talked about climate justice. I talk about social justice, we could talk about other forms, but what we're talking about are more just societies and whether your concern is with racial and ethnic groups, with people with disability, with climate justice, uh, that's got to come from people because governments by themselves won't listen. Uh, we've got to be out there speaking and being heard. Thank you, Michael. Natalie, I'd let me come to you for your, your response to this question. And then I'm going to wrap up by asking each of you to name one thing that people participating in tonight's session can go away and do to act on this 
on this really important issue themselves. So Latini, let me come to you first. Yeah, so I'm not quite sure what else I, I could add. I, I, I kind of would echo what both uh, Susanna and uh, Michael has said. I think there's something about that we need to be more active in civic life, I guess, and the importance of people who experience the greatest levels of disadvantage actually being in these leadership roles in these spaces where decisions are being made because I think if we are just relying solely on people without lived experience to uh, deliver the change for us I think it's going to be a painfully slow process so I think that there is something about how we are better share power and um, kind of you know influence decision making um, and also moving away from a position of self-interest in terms of just being solely concerned about what's good for us but thinking about what is good for society as a whole. Thank you and just to give you the, the opportunity if there's anything else that you want to to call on people to do um, please please do. So for, for me, it would be that um, I think to be open and explore the social determinants through an anti-racist lens um, and think about how what, what's within your gift, within your power to start at least starting to shift some of the mental models that you hold personally, but also those around you. Um, and that's about us having these conversations, which we like to call, you know, difficult conversations. And yes, it may feel uncomfortable it yes it may feel painful but actually it will get easier um, because fundamentally our lives depend on it thank you and thank you so much for taking part this evening um you know it's it's everything that you've said is so powerful and and i'm reading the the chat comments and, and just hearing how many people want to, to take forward and responding to what you're saying. So thank you so much for giving your expertise and your time this evening. And, and I know people want to follow up with you, so you might have a full inbox. <laughs> Fazana, can I come to you next? Um, and, and what one thing would you really want people to, to take forward to tackle the health inequalities and the, the disproportionate impact, not just of COVID-19, but of our structural our structural racism in this country how do we tackle it and what can people do i think you know of natalie captured it so well and just extending from that is that this is such a potentializing moment and yes there are going to be hard conversations one of the phrases we use a lot in healing justice is comfort and transformation can't live in the same house and so if we really want to transform our societies then and there are going to be uncomfortable uh, moments but absolutely where health and race intersect is probably one of the most profound spaces of liberation because it's about body and human dignity. If we get that right, imagine what kind of world we would be living in, um, the, the scale of abundance and thriving. And I believe that so much of that is possible in our lifetime. It's available, the solutions are there um, and how we you know, learn and listen to one another to make that possible. Um, is just really about the capacity we create within ourselves, in our communities, in our networks, in our fields for that transformation. Thank you. That, that phrase that you've just used is about body and human dignity. It's just so powerful. Um, and comfort and transformation can't live in the same house. You, yeah, There's, these words are going to resonate uh, and, uh, from everyone who's hearing them. So thank you for sharing. Michael, let me come to you last. And thinking about the work that you've been doing you know for over a decade a lot much much longer and thinking about the fact that you've you yourself have collected evidence that shows that very little is changing what can we do to bring about change so that the next pandemic headlines are not these headlines well a couple of things firstly it's not the case that very little is changing uh, in in England, we've been working with cities, with Coventry, with Greater Manchester, Chester and Merseyside, Gateshead, um, Tower Hamlets in London. It's not the case that nothing is changing. Nothing, uh, things change for the worse at national level, as I documented uh, over the last decade. 
but it's not the case that nothing is changing. And I can say the same elsewhere in the world. Uh, some countries at national level have embraced the social determinants health equity agenda. Uh, a lot have not. And within countries at subnational level, we've got cities and regions. So I'm not depressed about, oh, we produced all this evidence and no one's doing anything, because people are doing things. Uh, some are ignoring it, and we've got to work harder. The second is. What one thing can you leave us to take away to do differently? What, what one thing can we do? So let me just say that in my uh, report for the Americas, we were dealing with indigenous, non indigenous, African descendants, non African descendants, gender inequity, disability, sexual orientation. We were dealing with inequities on several dimensions. Um, Fazana mentioned intersectionality. So we weren't dealing with only the one dimension, the uh, black, non-black, or indigenous, non-indigenous. We are dealing with several. And I've been saying for some time, what we need to do is put equity, I'd say health equity, and now I would say sustainable health equity, at the heart of everything we're trying to achieve. If your concern is with racism, and that's a concern that I share, we need to put equity at the heart of everything we're trying to achieve. If your concern is disability, the same thing. If your concern is gender inequity, if we put equity at the heart of everything we're trying to achieve. Now just think what happened in 2010. What we heard was we put austerity at the heart of everything we're trying to achieve. Nothing about the well-being of the population didn't come anywhere. In our PAHO report, we put health and a dignified life as what we're trying to achieve. So putting equity at the heart with the aim of better health and the conditions that allow people to have dignified lives. That's what we should be doing and what we're striving towards. Thank you. I think, I think that phrase, putting equity at the heart of everything, um, that putting it that simply and that starkly is, is really helpful for us to think about what, is, what does good look like? What, is, what does better look like? So thank you so much. Um, obviously this discussion could go on for hours and i wish it could but i am very mindful of people's commitment to time and and to not uh not to overstep the time limit too much but thank you so much um michael Fazana, natalie you've been amazing um and we're incredibly grateful because these discussions are the way in which we challenge ourselves to face up to what we need to do to make the world the right place um, we do need data, but we also need that lived experience and, and bringing those perspectives together will be an ongoing challenge. And we also know that people in power often only listen to large scale data. So we must have that. And I, I take to heart your challenge, Michael, to make the data work for us, um, to think about how we engage with it and how we use it as a and I'm going to use the word weapon to, to fight this war um, to bring about the change that we need to. And hearing directly from and also involving people who have been affected directly in decision making, we are nowhere near where we need to be on that. But collectively, if we can push that forward and really thinking about those challenges around democracy is being heard. This is about people's body and human dignity and that sustainable health equity is, is one of the key goals. Thank you. Um